and I'm going to read a text or a portion of scripture that I have chosen which I believe is relevant to this um, wonderful uh, exposition and teaching which um, uh, the Reverend Watson is giving us. So I'm reading from 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 12 and 13. 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 12 and 13 where we read, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Amen. May God bless that reading of his word to us. So yesterday we read the first part, the t- uh, 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 portion that I chose to read from The Crook in the Lot by Thomas Watson. And in this, Watson is likening the difficulties that we have in our lives to crooks. Now, what he means by a crook isn't somebody who robs banks, but uh, uh, a, 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 a um, curved um, device such as on the crook of a shepherd when we should be or desiring to go straight on in life, straight forwards without any problems, a crook is put into our life. Um, it's something which causes us trouble. At times it might be something minor, which causes us a minor irritation. Maybe our car breaks down, and um, not in Thomas Watson's day, of course, but maybe our car breaks down and that gives us some inconvenience for a day or so. Maybe something very great. We may have prolonged um, torment from physical illness. Many have known that, in, and even now in our generation, as a doctor, I've met so many people who have pain which is difficult to manage. It may be that more than one trial comes at once. Relationship problems, health problems, financial problems, one problem after another, so that a person who feels that they cannot possibly um, come through these finds that they have a strength which comes from God that enables them to overcome all difficulties but not without going through the fiery furnace and or the furnace of affliction and uh, Watson calls all these things crooks they are things which are hindering our straight easy path in this world now when I think back over my Christian life and I've been a Christian for 38 years now uh, nearly 39 and when I think back over it, I think of all the time that I spent trying to have a trouble-free existence, trying to solve every single pro- problem, trying to um, have a, a life not of ease, but a life free of pain and difficulty and stress, which we suffer much in these days, uh, in this generation we live in. And yet what Watson has said to us is that this is never going to happen, and especially even more so for those of us who are Christians, that God allows these crooks, these um, uh, these uh, indentations or um, problems which come into our lives, and this is God's doing, that we must recognise that these crooks come from God. And learning to recognise this and how to manage these in a godly, a timely and holy manner is part of our growing to maturity as Christians. I think we're going to be reading quite a lot more about this in today's um, portion of The Crook in the Lot. But uh, lest I say um, too much uh, and do all the talking instead of Watson, I'm going to pray now and uh, briefly and then we will look at uh, Watson's um, uh, at his uh, book. Uh, And I trust, by God's grace, this will be a blessing to every one of us. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have men who have gone before us, who have written down and instructed us so thoroughly and faithfully in your word, in the Bible, Lord. And thank you for the Puritans. Thank you for a man like Thomas Watson and for this book, The Crook in the Lot. And Father, as we listen to it, and as it is read, I pray that you would give the unction of your Holy Spirit, so that this truth which is being expanded or expounded from your word would be a blessing to each and every heart. Father, every one of us has trials and troubles in our lives. Help us to learn how to bring these to you, Lord, to recognise your hand in all of these things, to recognise your goodness, mercy and love towards us in everything that happens to us, Lord. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you bless this reading of this book now. And this I ask and pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 
So, the crook in the lot, part two. Having seen the crook itself, we are in the next place to consider of God's making it. And here is to be shown, one, that it is of God's making, two, how it is of his making, and three, why he makes it. <clears throat> First, that the crook in the lot, whatever it is, is of God's making, appears from these three considerations. <coughs> Excuse me. First, it cannot be questioned, but the crook in the lot, considered as a crook, is a penal evil. Whatever it is for the matter of it, that is, whether the thing in itself, its immediate cause and occasion, are sinful or not, it is certainly a punishment of affliction. Now, as it may be, as such, holily and justly brought on us by our sovereign Lord and Judge, so he expressly claims the doing or making of it. Scripture quote, Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord has not done it? End quote. Wherefore, since there can be no penal evil but of God's making, and the crook in the lot is such an evil, it is necessarily concluded to be of God's making. Secondly, it is evident from the scripture doctrines of divine providence that God brings about every man's lot and all the parts of it. He sits at the helm of human affairs and turns them about in whatever way he lists. Scripture quote, Whatever the Lord pleased, that he did in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. End quote. There is not anything whatever befalls us without his overruling hand. The same providence that brought us out of the womb brings us to and fixes us in the condition and place allotted for us by him who, scripture quote, has determined the times and the bounds of our habitation. End quote. It overrules the smallest and most casual things about us, such as, scripture quote, hairs of our head being all numbered, end quote, and, scripture quote, lot cast into the lap, end quote. Yea, the free acts of our will, by which we choose for ourselves, for even, scripture quote, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as rivers of water, End quote. and the whole steps we make, and which others make in reference to us, for, scripture quote, the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man that walks to direct his steps. End quote. And this, whether these steps causing the crook are deliberate and sinful ones, such as Joseph's brothers selling him into Egypt, or whether they are undesigned, such as manslaughter, purely casual, as when one hewing wood kills his neighbour with, scripture quote, the head of the axe slipping from the halve, helve, sorry, end quote, for there is a holy and wise providence that governs the sinful and the heedless actions of men, as a rider does a lame horse, of whose halting not he, but the horse's lameness, is the true and proper cause. Wherefore, in the former of these cases, God is said to have sent Joseph into Egypt, and in the latter to deliver one into his neighbour's hand. Lastly, God has, by an eternal decree, immovable as mountains of brass, appointed the whole of every one's lot, the crooked part of it as well as the straight, by the same eternal decree by which the high and low parts of the earth, the mountains and the valleys, were appointed, are the heights and the depths, the prosperity and adversity, in the lot of the inhabitants of their determined. And they are brought about in time in a perfect agreeableness there. The mystery of providence in the government of the world is, in all the parts of it, the building reared up of God in exact conformity to the plan in his decree. Scripture quote, who works all things after the counsel of his own will, end quote, so that there is never a crook in one's lot, but may be run up to this original. Of this, Job piously sets us an example in his own case, Scripture quote, quote he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desires, even that he does. 
for he performs the thing that is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. End quote. Second, that we may see how the crook in the lot is of God's making, we must distinguish between pure sinless crooks and impure sinful ones. First, there are pure and sinless crooks, which are mere afflictions, cleanly crosses, grievous indeed, but not defiling. Such was Lazarus's poverty, Rachel's barrenness and Leah's tender eyes, the blindness of the man who had been so from his birth. Now the crooks of this kind are of God's making, by the efficacy of his power directly bringing them to pass and causing them to be. He is the maker of the poor. Scripture quote, Whoso mocks the poor reproaches his maker. End quote. That is, reproaches God who made him poor according to that. Quote, the Lord makes poor. End quote. It is he that has the key of the womb, and as he sees meets sees meat shuts it or opens it and it is scripture quote he that forms the eyes end quote and the man was born blind that the works of God should be manifested in him that was a scripture quote therefore he says to Moses scripture quote who makes the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind have not I the Lord end quote such crooks in the lot are of God's making in the most ample sense and in their full comprehension, being the direct effects of his agency, as well as the heavens and the earth. Secondly, there are impure, sinful crooks, which in their own nature are sins, as well as afflictions, defiling as well as grievous. Such was the crook made in David's lot, through his family disorders, the defiling of Tamar, the murder of Ammon, Amnon, the rebellion of Absalom, all of them unnatural. Of the same kind was that made in Job's lot by the Sabaeans and Chaldeans taking away his substance and slaying his servants. As these were the afflictions of David and Job respectively, so they were the sins of the actors, the unhappy instruments of it. Thus one and the same thing may be to one a heinous sin defiling and laying him under guilt and to another an affliction, laying him under suffering only. Now the crooks of this kind are not of God's making in the same latitude as those of the former, for he neither puts evil in the heart of any, nor stirs up to it. Scripture quote, He cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man. End quote. But they are of his making, by his holy permission of them, powerful, bounding of them, and wise overruling of them to some good end. First, he holily permits them, suffering men, scripture quote, to walk in their own ways, end quote, though he is not the author of those sinful crooks, causing them to be by the efficacy of his power. Yet if he did not permit them, willing not to hinder them, they could not be at all, for, scripture quote, he shuts and no man opens, end quote. But he justly withholds his grace, which the sinner does not desire, takes off the restraint under which he is uneasy, and since the sinner will be gone, lays the reins on his neck and leaves him to swing of his lust. Scripture quote, He frame is joined to his idols, let him alone. End quote. Scripture quote, Israel would none of me, so I gave them up to their own heart's lusts. End quote. In which unhappy situation the sinful crook does, does, from the sinner's own proper motion, naturally and infallibly follow, even as water runs down a hill, wherever there is a gap left open before it. So in these circumstances, scripture quote, Israel walked in their own counsels, end quote. And thus this kind of crook is of God's making, as a just judge punishing the sufferer by it. This view of the matter silenced to David under Shimei's cursings. Scripture quote, quote, Let him alone, and let him curse, for the Lord has bidden him. End quote. Secondly, he powerfully bounds them. Scripture quote, The remainder of wrath you shall restrain. 
end quote. Uh, and um, Watson comments that it's talking about the creatures, not the creator's wrath here, um, man's wrath, not the wrath of God. Did not God bound these crooks, however sore they are in anyone's case, they would be yet sorer. But he says to the sinful instrument, as he said to the sea, Scripture quote, Until this time you shall come, but no further, and here your proud waves shall be stayed. End quote. He lays a restraining band on him, that he cannot go one step farther in the way of his impetuous lust drives than he sees me to permit. Thus it comes to pass that the crook of this kind is neither more nor less, but just as great as he, by his powerful bounding, makes it to be. An eminent instance of this we have in the case of Job, whose lot was crooked through a peculiar agency of the devil. But even to that grand sinner, God set a bound in the case. Scripture quote, the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your, ha in your power, only do not put forth your hand on him. End quote. Now Satan went the full length of the bound, leaving nothing within the compass of it untouched, which he saw could make for his purpose. But he could by no means move one step beyond it to carry his point, which he could not gain within it. And therefore to make the trial greater and the crook sorer, nothing remains but that the bound set should be removed and the sphere of his agency enlarged, for which cause he says, Scripture quote, but touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face, end quote. And it being removed accordingly, but with all a new one set, Scripture quote, behold, he is in your hand, but save his life, end quote. The crook was carried to the utmost that the new bound would permit, in a consistency with his design of bringing Job to blaspheme. Scripture quote, Satan smote him with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. End quote. And had it not been for this bound securing Job's life, he, after finding this attempt unsuccessful too, had doubtless dispatched him at once. Thirdly, he, that is God, wisely overrules them to some good purpose, becoming the divine perfections. While the sinful instrument has an ill design in the crook, caused by him, God directs it to a holy and good end. In the disorders of David's family, Amnon's design was to gratify a brutish lust, Absalom's to glut himself for revenge and to satisfy his pride and ambition. But God meant by that means to punish David for his sin in the matter of Uriah. In the crook made in Job's lot by Satan and the Sabaeans and Chaldeans, his instruments, Satan's design was to cause Job to blaspheme, and theirs to gratify their covetousness. But God had another design in this way, becoming himself, becoming himself, namely, to manifest Job's sincerity and uprightness. Did he not wisely and powerfully overrule those crooks made in men's lot? No good could come out of them, but he always overrules them so as to fulfil his own holy purposes in this way. Howbeit the sinner means not so, for his designs cannot miscarry. His scripture quote, counsel shall stand, end quote. So the sinful crook is, by the overruling hand of God, turned about to his own glory and his people's good in the end. According to the word, scripture quote, the Lord has made all things for himself, end quote. New quote, all things work together for good, for the good, to them that love God, end quote. Thus Haman's plot for the destruction of the Jews Scripture quote was turned to the contrary, end quote. Turned to the contrary, end quote. And the crook made in Joseph's lot by his own brothers, selling him into Egypt, though it was on their part most sinful and of a most mischievous design, yet, as it was of God's making, by his holy permission, powerful bounding, and wisely overruling it, 
had an issue well becoming the divine wisdom and goodness, both of which Joseph notices to them. Scripture quote, As for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it to good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to keep many people alive. End quote. 3. It remains to inquire why God makes a crook why God makes a crook in one's lot, and this is to be cleared by discovering the design of that dispensation, a matter which it concerns everyone to know, and carefully to notice in order to a Christian improvement of the crook in their lot. The design of it seems to be chiefly sevenfold. First, the trial of one's state, whether one is in the state of grace or not, whether a sincere Christian or a hypocrite, though every affliction is trying, yet here I conceive lies the main providential trial a man is brought into with reference to his state, for as much as the crook in the lot being a matter of continued course, one has occasion to open and show himself again and again in the same thing, from where it comes to pass, that it ministers ground for a decision in that momentous point. It was plainly on this foundation that the trial of Job's state was put. The question was whether Job was an upright and sincere servant of God, as God himself testified of him, or but a mercenary one, a hypocrite, as Satan alleged against him. And the trial of this was put on the crook to be made in his lot. Accordingly, that which all his friends, save Elihu, the last speaker, did in their reasonings with him under his trial, aim at, was to prove him a hypocrite. Satan thus making use of these good men for gaining his point, as God made trial of Israel in the wilderness for the land of Canaan by a trial of afflicting dispensations, which Caleb and Joshua, bearing strenuously, were declared suitable to enter the promised land as having followed the Lord fully, while others, being tried out with them, their carcasses fell in the wilderness. So he makes trial of men for heaven by the crook in their lot. If one can stand that test, he is manifested to be a saint, a sincere servant of God, as Job was proved to be. If not, he is but a hypocrite. He cannot stand the test of the crook in his lot, but goes away like dross in God's furnace, a melancholy instance of which we have in that manner a man of honour and wealth, who with high pretences of religion, arising from a principle of moral seriousness, addressed himself to our Saviour to know, quote, Bible quote, what he should do that he might inherit eternal life, end quote. Our Saviour, to discover the man to himself, makes a crook in his lot where all along before it had stood even, obliging him by a probatory command to sell and give away all that he had and follow him. Scripture quote, Sell whatever you have and give to the poor and come, take up the cross and follow me. End quote. By this means he was at that moment in the court of conscience stripped of his great possession, so that from that time forward he could no longer keep them with a good conscience, as he might have done before. The man instantly felt the smart of this crook made in his lot. Scripture quote, he was sad at that saying, end quote. That is, immediately upon the hearing of it, being struck with pain, disorder and confusion of mind, his countenance changed, became cloudy and lowering, as the same word is used. He could not stand the test of that crook. He could by no means submit his lot to God in that point, but behoved to have it at any rate according to his own mind. So he, scripture quote, went away grieved, for he had great possessions, end quote. He went away from Christ back to his plentiful estate, and though with a pained and sorrowful heart, sat him down again on it, a violent possessor before the Lord, thwarting the divine order. 
and there is no appearance that ever this order was revoked, or that ever he came to a better temper in reference to it. Secondly, excitation to duty, weaning one from this world, and prompting him to look after the happiness of the other world, many have been beholden to the crook in their lot. For that ever they came to themselves, settled and turned serious, going for a time like a wild ass used to the wilderness, scorning to be turned, their foot has slid in due time, and a crook, a crook, a crook being by that means made in their lot, their mouth has come wherein they have been caught. Thus was the prodigal brought to himself, and obliged to entertain thoughts of returning to his father. The crook in their lot convinces them at length that their rest is not here, finding still a pricking thorn of uneasiness whenever they lay down their head where they would fain take rest in the creature and that they are obliged to lift it again, they are brought to conclude there is no hope from that quarter, and begin to cast about for rest another way, so it makes them errands to God, which they did not have before, for as much as they feel a need of the comforts of the other world, to which their mouths were out of taste, while their lot stood even to their mind. Wherefore, whatever use we make of the crook in our lot, the voice of it is, scripture quote, arise and depart, this is not your rest, end quote. And it is surely that which of all means of mortification of the afflictive king most deadens a real Christian to this life and world. Amen. Good instruction. I continue. Thirdly, conviction of sin as when one walking heedlessly is suddenly taken ill of a lameless, name, lameness, his going halting the rest of his way convinces him of having made a wrong step. And every new painful step begin brings it sorry, every new painful step brings it afresh to his mind. So God makes a crook in one's lot to convince him of some false step he has made, or course he has taken. What the sinner would otherwise be apt to overlook, forget, or think light of, is by this means recalled to mind, set before him as an evil and bitter thing, and kept in remembrance that his heart may every now and then bleed for it afresh. Thus, by the crook, men's sin finds them out to their conviction. Scripture quote, as the thief is ashamed when he is found, end quote. To which Joseph's brothers feelingly express, under the crook made in their lot in Egypt, Scripture quote, we are verily guilty concerning our brother, end quote. New quote, God has found out the iniquity of your servants, end quote. The crook in the lot, usually in its nature of circumstances, so naturally refers to the false step or course that it serves for a providential memorial of it, bringing the sin, sin, though of an old date, fresh to remembrance, and for a badge of the sinner's folly in word or deed, to keep it ever before him. When Jacob found Leah through Laban's unfair dealing, palmed on him for Rachel, how could he miss of a stinging remembrance of the cheat he had, seven years at least before, put on his own father, pretending himself to be Esau? How could it miss of galling him occasionally afterwards during the course of the marriage? He had imposed on his father the younger brother for the elder, and Laban imposed on him the elder sister for the younger. The dimness of Isaac's eyes favoured the former cheat, and the darkness of the evening did as much favour the latter. So he behoved to say, as Adoni Bezek in another case, scripture quote, As I have done, so God has requited me. Requited me, requited me. End quote. In like manner, Rachel, dying in childbirth, could hardly avoid a melancholy reflection on her rash and passionate expression, scripture quote, give me qu children, or else I die, end quote. Even Holy Job read in the crook in his lot some false steps he had made in his youth many years before, 
Scripture quote, You write bitter things against me and make me possess the iniquities of my youth. End quote. Fourthly, correction or punishment for sin. In nothing more than in the crook of the lot is that word verified. Scripture quote, Your own wickedness shall correct you, and your backslidings shall reprove you. End quote. God may for a time wink at one's sin, which afterward he will set a brand of his indignation upon, in crooking the sinner's lot, as he did in the case of Jacob and of Rachel, mentioned before. Though the sin was a passing action, or a course of no long continuance, the mark of the divine displeasure for it, set on the sinner in the crook of his lot, may pain him long and sore, that by repeated experience he may know what an evil and bitter thing it was. David's killing Uriah by the sword of the Ammonites was soon over, but for that cause, scripture quote, the sword never departed from his house, end quote. Gehazi quickly obtained two bags of money from Naaman in the way of falsehood and lying, but as a lasting mark of the divine indignation against the profane trick, he got with all a leprosy, which craved to him while he lived, and to his posterity after him. This may be the case as well where the sin is pardoned, as to the guilt of eternal wrath, as where it is not. And one may have confessed and sincerely repented of that sin, which yet shall make him go halting to the grave, though it cannot carry him to hell. A man's person may be accepted in the Beloved, who yet has a particular badge of the divine displeasure with, with his sin hung on him in the crook of his lot. Scripture quote, You were a God that forgave them, though you took vengeance on their inventions. End quote. Fifthly, preventing of sin. Scripture quote, I will hedge up your way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. End quote. The crook in the lot will readily be found to lie cross to some wrong bias of the heart, which peculiarly sways with the party, so it is like a thorn hedge, or a wall in the way, which that bias inclines him to. The defiling objects in the world specially take and prove ensnaring, as they are suited to the particular cast of temper in men. But by means of the crook in the lot, the paint and varnish is worn off the defiling object, by which it loses its former taking appearance. Thus the edge of corrupt affections is blunted, temptation weakened, and much sin prevented. The sinner, after scripture quote, getting about so much to change his way, resuming ashamed, end quote, thus the Lord crooks one's lot that, scripture quote, he may withdraw from man, he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from men, end quote. And so, scripture quote, he keeps back his soul from the pit, end quote. Everyone knows what is most pleasant to him, but God alone knows what is most profitable. As all men are liars, so all men are fools too. He is the only wise God. He is the only wise God. Many are obliged to the crook in their lot, but they do not go to those excesses which their vain minds and corrupt affections would fill, for with full sail carry them to, and they would from their hearts bless God for making it if they did but calmly consider what would most likely be the issue of the removal of it. Anything which preserves us from falling into sin is good and an exceedingly great mercy. When one is in hazard of fretting under the hardship of bearing the crook, he would do well to consider what condition he is as yet in to bear its removal in a Christian manner. Sixthly, discovery of latent corruption, whether in saints or sinners. There are some corruptions in every man's heart which lie, as it were, so near the surface that they are ready on every turn to rise up. But then there are others also which lie so very deep that they are scarcely observed at all. But as the fire under the pot makes the scum rise up, appear on top and run over, so the crook in the lot rises up from the bottom, 
and brings out such corruption as otherwise one could hardly imagine to be within. Who would have suspected such strength of passion in the meek Moses as he discovered at the waters of strife, and for which he was kept out of Canaan, or so much bitterness of spirit in the patient Job as to charge God with becoming cruel to him? so much ill-nature in the good Jeremiah as to curse not only the day of his birth, but even the man who brought tidings of it to his father. Or such a tang of atheism is a saff as to pronounce religion a vain thing. But the crook in the lot bringeth out these things, showed them to have been within, how long soever they had lurked unobserved. And as this design, however indecently proud scoffers allow themselves to treat it, is in no way inconsistent with the divine perfections, so the discovery of itself is necessary for the due humiliation of sinners, and to stain the pride of all glory that men may know themselves both of which appear in that it was on this very design that God made the long-continued crook in Israel's lot in the wilderness even to humble them and to prove them, to know what was in their heart. Seventhly, the exercise of grace in the children of God, or seventhly, the exercise of grace in the children of God, believers through the remains of indwelling corruption are liable to fits of spiritual laziness and inactivity in which their graces lie dormant for the time. Besides, there are some graces which of their own nature are but occasional in their exercise as being exercised only upon occasion of certain things which they have a necessary relation to such as patience and long-suffering. Now the crook in the lot serves to rouse up a Christian to the exercise of the graces, overpowered by corruption, and with all to call forth to action the occasional graces, ministering proper occasions for them. The truth is, the crook in the lot is the great engine of providence for making men appear in their true colours, discovering both their ill and their, God, and their good. And if the grace of God is in them, it will bring it out and cause it to display itself. It so puts the Christian to his shifts that however it makes him stagger for a while, yet it will at length evidence both the reality and the strength of grace in him. Scripture quote, You are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, may be found unto praise. End quote. The crook in the lot gives rise to many acts of faith, hope, love, self-denial, resignation, and other graces, to many heavenly breathings, partings, and groanings, which otherwise would not be brought forth, and I make no question but these things, however by carnal men despised as trifling, are more precious in the sight of God than even believers themselves are aware of, being acts of immediate internal worship, and will have a surprising notice taken of them, and of the sum of them, at long run. However it may be, the persons themselves often can hardly think them worth their own notice at all. The steady routing, or routing, if you're in America, I guess, of a gallant army or horse and foot to the routing or routing of the enemy is highly prized. In this case, it is routing. We speak about the routing of an enemy. Apologies for not getting that right. But the acting of holy fear and humble hope is in reality far more valuable as being so in the sight of God whose judgment we are sure is according to truth. This the psalmist teaches, the scripture quote, He delights not in the strength of the horse, he takes not pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord takes pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. End quote. And indeed, the exercise of the graces of his Spirit in his people is so very pre precious in his sight that whatever grace any of them excel in, they will readily get such a crook made in their lot as will be a special trial of it that will make a proof of its full strength. Abraham excelled in the grace of faith. 
in trusting God's bare word a promise above the dictates of sense, and God giving him a promise that he would make of him a great nation, made with all a crook in his lot, by which he had enough ado with all the strength of his faith, while he was obliged to leave his country and kindred and sojourn among the Canaanites, his wife continuing barren till past the age of childbearing, and when she had at length brought forth Isaac, and he was grown up, he was called to offer him up for a burnt offering, the more exquisite trial of his faith, that Ishmael was now expelled his family, and that it was declared that in Isaac only his seed should be called. Scripture quote, Moses was very meek above all the men which were on the face of the earth, End quote. And he was entrusted with the conduct of a most perverse and unmanageable people. The crook in his lot plainly designed for the exercise of his meekness. Job excelled in patience, and by the crook in his lot he got as much to do with it. For God gives none of his people to excel in a gift, but some time or other he will afford them use for the whole compass of it. Now I'm going to leave that there. Uh, this this doctrine which Thomas Watson is bringing out is making me sing. It's making me sing to think that God will um, deal with us in these ways. It's making so many trials and afflictions seem to have such profound meaning in my life and uh, in our lives. And 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 this is just glorious to know that that God when he sends us afflictions, does so to try us, to to, 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 to refine us, to, to keep us from sin, which is so important, and to stir us up to serve him and to seek him, uh, and so on. This list of seven things is remarkable, and it, it's absolutely thrilling my heart to read this to you now. Now, in the next episode, we come to the use of the doctrine. Uh, uh, and um, I shall leave that to the next episode. But uh, I, I, I'm really thrilled. I'm thanking God for this uh, for this teaching and on, on the crook in the lot. And 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 I wish I had read this many years ago because it's thrilling, absolutely thrilling, to read of the way in which God deals with us with so many scriptural proofs. Amen. May God bless us to each and every one of us who enjoys and benefits from listening to it. <laughs>